Uh, Stephen Hicks, Executive Director of the Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship, and our guest this evening is uh, Jeffrey Orduno, uh, attorney in Rockford. Uh, Rockford College graduate in the early 1990s, majored in business, went on to get a law degree at John Marshall Law School, and now uh, practices contract and property rights cases. And the theme of the lecture tonight uh, in the business and economic ethics class was property rights and the law, with special focus on uh, the, the legal landscape uh, as it has evolved with respect to the takings clause coming out of the Fifth Amendment of the, of the Constitution. Uh, uh, Mr. Orduno, uh, what is the takings clause or what, what's the relevant portion of it in the Fifth Amendment here? Well, the takings clause literally tells us that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. And what that is is a reflection or a limit on the power of eminent domain. Uh, the United States government and similarly state governments as sovereign entities almost undisputedly have the power of eminent domain. They can go and for a public use, and that, uh, that's in dispute, but for a public use, take private property and then in turn they're expected to pay just compensation to the owner of that property. Mm -hmm. and the idea here is so that the government can perform its legitimate functions, it needs space for or land for government buildings, for uh, perhaps building bridges and roads and schools, right, and so on. So uh, eminent domain uh, and that takings clause is designed for that set of functions. That's right, and eminent domain helps avoid the problems of holdouts. Uh, so for example, if we were building, a, the government were going to build an interstate highway and one person uh, would not voluntarily sell his property to the government for the construction of the highway, uh, the eminent domain power, the condemnation power, we would call it, could be used to uh, basically cause by court process a compulsory exchange with that individual to take his property in exchange for just compensation, the market value of the property. Okay. Now, the original language is relatively clear, but nonetheless there's been a lot of interpretation and reinterpretation and discussion and debate about scope over the course of the last two centuries or so. And uh, in your lecture tonight you mentioned four ways in which the original takings clause has been uh, either reinterpreted or transformed into something significantly uh, different. The first of the ways in which you mentioned is that uh, certain kinds of property are now uh, legally more or less just considered not as property, and so the taking clause doesn't apply to those. So what examples do you have in mind here? Well, when we talk about that, uh, I would say one thing comes to mind. That will be the power of, of zoning. We kind of unquestionably say that the government can tell us what we can or can't do with our property in terms of regulations. And when they do that, when they tell us what we can't do, they've taken away our right to do something. Mm. That we, and we have to envision a world, let's say, before all of these zoning regulations. It becomes a dicier issue to stop now and say, well, when we buy property, we know it's subject to zoning regulations. But if we go way back in time and say, what do we think of as zoning as a concept? Um, when we put restrictions on the use of property, is that a taking? I would say that the trend of the cases in the takings law has been to rule out certain types of uh, what we'd call regula regulatory takings or uh, things that don't literally take a piece of property. It's been to say, well, that's not really a taking. And a lot of times what that is is a permutation of what we call the police power. Mm. The government's power to act uh, for the common good, for the general welfare. And what they do is they come along and say, you can't do this. And the do this might be anything from build certain things on your property, or it might be to uh, exercise, uh, let's say, our, our ability to work in a certain industry without having a certain license that magically costs all kind of, kinds of money or is hard mm -hmm. to get. Um, when they tell us we can't do something, they say, well, that's in the public interest. The problem is that all of those things, when you tie them back, especially a lot of the property uses, what the police power was intended to be for was to prevent somebody doing something harmful to another person. Mm -hmm. It was intended to prevent me using my property in a way that harms my neighbor, mm -hmm. or for example, using my property uh, in such a way that has downstream effects. It wasn't intended, the police power wasn't intended to be able to tell me what I could or couldn't do with my property when I'm not hurting other people with it. But that's what it's been kind of contorted into. 
the government now says we can use that police power to pass what the court would think are reasonable regulations about how to use property, what to use it for, what not to use it for, even where people aren't using their property in a way that's harmful to others. So that's a backhanded taking. Okay. All right. So some things that originally would have counted as takings are no longer counted as takings. All right. And another right. part of the uh, uh, discussion involved the language of just compensation, which certainly sounds fair, but you're saying that now in practice that has come to mean some compensation. In most cases, it's not just compensation, whatever that would mean. Sure. And a lot of that, uh, to be really honest, some of that, even if the government were to start at fair market value compensation or to start close to it, the problem is that by the time uh, there's payment to litigate a lawsuit over whether taking is right and what the valuation should be, and appraisers and attorneys and experts are paid, what does the person really end up with? Mm -hmm. They end up with less than they would have had. And, and I guess my point is it's part of the bullying tendency that we would see anytime you have a disproportionate balance of power mm -hmm. where the government can come along and say, hey, landowner, we want to take your property. Here's what we would give you for it. Mm -hmm. Are you going to dispute that? And then the landowner says, well, I don't think that's enough, but how much is it going to cost that landowner to get to the end of the line right. over what the right amount is? Right. It'll be going up against government deep pockets or developer deep pockets exactly. right, and so on. Another uh, element is the original uh, takings clause says for public use, and that has been expanded to mean public interest. Uh, what does that mean? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> it's, that's a great question. Um, it's uh, plagued the Supreme Court even a little bit lately, but we see it trickling off to a very common use, like in the Kelo case, is economic development. Um, people saying that this would be for the public good. Um, it's really deviated, and in the Kelo case, Justice Stevens even suggests or notes that the trend of the cases has gone, of the, the Supreme Court cases, in looking at what really public use is or how strictly that rule is going to be construed has gone from public use, literally the government using the property or literally the public being on the property. It goes through a phase where, okay, what about railroads? What about railroads? You know, they are common carriers. So now is, you know, uh, taking property for railway purposes, is that a public use? Mm -hmm. Eventually we get to, yes, that's a, you know, that's a public use. And it keeps on moving out or uh, expanding over time mm -hmm. to where now we're so far removed from what is a legitimate public use that I would say what we're doing now is abusive to the original intent of the takings clause.